and I think we're up and running here then. Okay, uh, last week we spent a lot of time talking about not evolution yet. We're about to get into that in a few minutes, and I think that's where, where uh, kind of things culminate. Uh, but we were talking about what has to come before that, and that is how to explain the initial appearance of life on this planet. Uh, because you can't evolve anything until you have something alive that can undergo changes, etc. So we'll get into all of that. You don't no normally hear much about that, uh, but that's a huge crucial step. You have to go, if you want to try to explain everything that we see without there being a creator involved, well, then you have to explain, as we've said, the initial appearance of all the mass and energy in this universe and the precise organization of the universe, this galaxy, this solar system, this planet, etc. Uh, against the overwhelming odds uh, uh, that it would actually be suitable for life, uh, which everyone agrees, everyone agrees, is an overwhelmingly unlikely thing to have happened uh, without intervention. Then you have to explain life appearing, any kind of life appearing on this planet from something that was dead. Okay, so we talked a lot about that last week. And we'll spend just the, the first couple of minutes wrapping up that part of the discussion uh, and then going, going on to our fourth major question. <clears throat> so uh, now I, I, if you're just coming in this, this week and you were not here last week, I realize that a little uh, bit of a disadvantage there because we're certainly not going to go back and review everything in, in uh, consideration for your time. But we looked through all of that and, and about 70 years now of, I would say, really, really intelligent, dedicated research work by hundreds of people, many, many groups, trying to demonstrate uh, you know, provide some possible mechanism how life could have appeared on this planet from non-living things spontaneously without the intervention of some superior entity. Uh, and nobody's been able to do it. Nobody's been able to even come close. Nobody's been able to even come remotely close to being remotely close. Okay? And this is with some brilliant people trying to make it happen, trying to either explain it could happen, observe anything like it happening, or in, in the most ideal conditions, trying to make something happen. Nobody yet can do it. All right? Um, and in life, we looked at the fact that even the simplest life on this planet, there is no simple life because it's incredibly complex. You take the most primitive, simplest organism on this planet, and it is complex beyond imagination. It would appear as if some super, super genius designed it exactly the way it is. Everybody agrees it would appear that way. There's no, there's no disagreement about that, okay? The disagreement is only, is that what happened or did it happen at, at random? Well, here's what I will tell you. Uh, this is a, a, a quote, not from a noted scholar, but simply from me. Okay, but where there's the noticeable appearance of design, for example, the, the precise structure of this universe and this planet, etc., and the forces that, that work in it, or the initial appearance of life, this incredibly complex thing that nobody can explain, okay, but it reeks of design. Where there's the noticeable appearance of design, well, the possibility that design might have happened has to be the first thing on your list for consideration. Now, in fairness, it's not the only consideration. We need to consider every competing theory, and we're trying to do that. But it has to be number one on your list, um, okay? And, and that's true even if you can't understand how it could have been designed, even if you don't, at least at the moment, even if you don't know who or what might have designed it, nevertheless, the possibility that something did has to be the first thing that pops up on, on your list as the cause. If you refuse to do that, again, you're not really looking for the truth. If you refuse to do that, I mean, because that's just such clear logic, uh, then you have abandoned honest inquiry, you have abandoned valid logic if you refuse to consider. Now, as I've made so clear, you've got to consider the other alternatives too, because maybe it wasn't designed. Both have to be on your list, all right? Well, and last week, I kind of showed you with all of the incredible effort that has gone into trying to figure out or reproduce how you could get anything living from something non-living, 
Uh, I mean, it, it's just, and I'm so grateful that people are trying to do that because they have beat this thing relentlessly for 70 years now and still nobody's come close. So I finally said, at what point do you just say, okay, guys, this is not working. This hypothesis that it happened by chance spontaneously from something non-living, this is just not working. Let's go back to the drawing board and consider the other hypotheses, the other alternatives. I'll just tell you, it would make more sense really at this point to, to try to, to explain how it was that I shot John F. Kennedy. Uh, and I was a, a, a newborn living in Wellington, New Zealand at the time. But hey, don't let that stop you, okay? Uh, you know, if you're gonna throw logic to the winds, and just choose the most unlikely explanation for something instead of the one that's in front of you, well, why not, okay? But at some point you have to just say, all right, this explanation just is not working. All right, uh, so wrapping that up for our third major question, the initial appearance of life on this planet, let me uh, give you if you want to uh, keep up with some notes, again, I will offer you all of this when, when we're done in a couple of weeks, if you want it. Um, because, I, in fact, I've uh, gone back, spent quite some hours on this uh, last night, too, which was very good for me to get my mind engaged in something that I could uh, feel passionate about. Um, but I went back even and added a bunch of slides to some previous ones about M theory and some things like that. Uh, but at any rate, so just wrapping up what we've been talking about this past week, for the appearance of life, you've either got the, the, the theory that a superior entity created this and designed it, uh, you've got the prevailing uh, naturalistic or, or you might say atheistic theory uh, that it happens spontaneously somehow from, from dead matter. Uh, etc. But there's still no prevailing theory because every every group that has a theory on how that could have happened will tell you all the others are, are dead wrong, and, and nobody has, there is no prevailing theory uh, for how it happened. I mentioned to you this one that that life actually landed here on a meteorite or something like that. Uh, that's pretty much discarded though because it doesn't explain anything, uh, and it's obviously not falsifiable in any way, et cetera, not, not scientific, okay? So those are our, our choices that we've, we've discussed here. All right, well, let's take a look at them then. Uh, first of all, are these things testable? Can you run an experiment? Is this true science? No, none of them are, none of them. So don't let somebody tell you that, oh, well, you know, the idea that, that there might be a creator, that's not science. Correct, that's not science. It's beyond science. Well, guess what? The idea that it happens spontaneously, that's not science either, in the strictest sense. Okay, you cannot test it. None of these things. Is it observable? No, none of them are. Uh, again, uh, because none of us were there to directly observe it. Dan? You can test it by doing it again. Yeah, and that's what people have been trying to do for 70 well, years. Sure, I'm just saying that it's not completely outside their own. Oh, system. okay, sure, it sure, is, good point. Yeah, no, okay, in fact, that's what I'm about to say right here. No, that's a good point. It's, yes, you, you can test it in a sense. You can't say this is how it originally happened, but you could try to reproduce it, exactly. And that's what people have been trying to do. Uh, in fact, no, you, you make a very good point there, and that's exactly what I'm coming to next. Is it compatible with what we do know? Um, the idea that there was a, a creation by a superior entity, uh, yes, again, you might not like that hypothesis, but it is perfectly compatible with what we observe around us, if it were true. Um, as far as it happening spontaneously, is that compatible? Well, there is no prevailing theory. Uh, nobody really has a proposed mechanism for how it happened. But what we do know is from the testing that we can do of trying to reproduce something like that or observe it, that none of them are compatible with the phenomena that we observe. We, we, we try as you might, we don't see this happening. Okay, so th that, that is a very good point. And therefore I come to, is it falsifiable? Well, no. The idea that it was done by a creator, that's not directly, there's, not, there's no way to, to completely disprove that. So it is not falsifiable, potentially falsifiable, uh, by that definition. Is this largely no, except it's largely not falsifiable, okay? But to the extent that you can test it, just as Daniel pointed out here a second ago, to the extent that you can try to reproduce it, well, it's found that it doesn't work. So to the extent that it can be falsified, it's not compatible uh, with what we know. 
Uh, and again, the one, the meteorite uh, theory, I'm, I'm not going to give that a whole lot of uh, further consideration. So, what makes the most sense? If you don't have a prevailing theory, and what you can test turns out to be impossible so far, with the, the best minds working on it for 70 years since the Miller-Urey experiment we talked about, it doesn't have power to explain anything at the moment. This one, you might not like it, but it would fit perfectly as an explanation for what we observe. Let me tell you this, the Miller-Urey experiment that we started this little thing with, you remember I told you about that in 1952? Very clever experiment where they tried to reproduce what, what they thought might have been the conditions on the early Earth to see if you could get something. Okay, we, we went through all of that. <clears throat> Here's the Nobel Prize winner who was the, the uh, mentor for that experiment. Look at what he said in 1962. All of us who study the origin of life find that the more we look into it, the more we feel it is too complex to have evolved or to have originated anywhere. Now notice this. We all believe as an article of faith that life evolved from dead matter on this planet. It is just that its complexity is so great it is hard for us to imagine that it did. What he's telling you is, you know, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't fit with anything we know. It is hard to imagine that it could have happened, but that's what happened. We're going to believe it. It's a religion with us. We believe it as an article of faith, whether it makes any sense or not, which it doesn't. I tell you, you've got some problems with thought process there, and this is a very brilliant man, okay, who refuses to consider the idea that there could have been a designer for it. Well, that brings us really to the fourth major question, our last one. And this is where it kind of all culminates. Uh, and that is, okay, if you've got some life on this planet, how do you get from that to the diversity and complexity and precision of life that we see all around us? Humans, your dog, the tree in the front yard. Uh, okay, all of it functioning together. How, how do you, with, I, I don't even know, I, I haven't looked up recently how many tens of thousands of different species are, are thought to exist on this planet currently. Um, how do you get to that? And that's where the, the kind of the whole thing comes together. Once again, let me just remind us of what our choices are. Here's the first one, uh, that there is a superior entity, a designer, uh, who created everything that physically exists and has the power to do that, whether we can fathom that or not. Okay, so that's, that's one, uh, one very prominent hypothesis, as you well know. Okay, here's the original evolution uh, hypothesis. This is, by, by a proper definition, this is Darwinism or gradualism. Okay, that once primitive life existed somehow, it underwent a long and, and unending series of random changes some of which proved to be beneficial uh, and actually had a survival advantage and therefore these were preserved and propagated by natural selection, the weeding out the, the, the less uh, uh, useful things uh, because of the survival advantage that, that these random changes conferred. And so these originally gave rise to greater changes and finally the appearance of new species, new functions, new anatomy, you know, et cetera, everything that we have. Okay, that's the original uh, Darwin's theory. Here's the current one. It's sometimes called neo-Darwinism or macroevolution. Okay, it's the same thing except incorporating the fact that we now know how DNA works. This amazing discovery. So, uh, so now what it would it would it would be the same thing, but these are are now gradual changes because of genetic mutations. Darwin didn't know anything about DNA. He couldn't have. Okay. Uh, so he didn't, he didn't know what uh, supposedly would have caused these, these random changes, but now you can fill in genetic mutations. And they give rise to greater changes, more complexity, and added genetic material, additional genes and chromosomes, and the appearance of new species. So that just kind of let you know where we are. 
There's another possibility on here called punctuated equilibrium. This is kind of a subset of evolution. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at that specifically because it acknowledges some of the big problems with the evolutionary theory and says, hey, what if this happened instead? What if evolution happened in a different way? So it's a, it's a very interesting thing that we'll look at as well. All right. I, I say once again, please note that abiogenesis, that's what we just talked about, our third major question, the, the supposed appearance of living material from spontaneously from dead material. That's a separate phenomenon from evolution, uh, although both have to happen uh, if you want to have a, a completely naturalistic, a, you know, no, no divine intervention, etc., uh, explanation for life. And they're often just kind of grouped together as the general theory of evolution. That is, both together had to happen. All right, so you see that, that each one, though, is a separate question, each one with its own uh, probability or lack thereof of, of happening. So just wanted to remind us of that. Okay, you might just say, look, I, I believe in God. I believe in, in okay, etc. Why do we, this is maybe bordering on sacrilege. Why do we even need to consider this? Well, I, look, I'm going to be the first to tell you every one of us needs to consider this. <coughs> If I would want somebody else to be open-minded, I said this at the very beginning of our series, if I would want somebody else to be open-minded and actually look at the evidence and use their logic and, and good sense, then I have to be willing to do the same thing. I have to be willing to, to truly, truly consider that there might not be a creator. Um, Otherwise, my thought process has certainly no more validity than anybody else's thing. I always feel it's important to point out that it doesn't have to be a dichotomy, that it doesn't have to be an either or. Uh, I just, uh, I guess, I, I've talked to you, of course, yeah. many, many times about this, but I, that's the, I guess, the same position. I believe very strongly in evolution. That's about as much as I can believe anything, I believe in evolution. And I think that attacking it based on you can't believe God in evolution does a disservice to even thinking about it to start with because you put yourself yeah. in a mindset where you don't consider it. And therefore, we're not going to do that. Right. You, have, you, have, uh, you have a premonition of the, the next couple of slides here. Uh, and I very much appreciate your mention. That, that's coming up specifically in just a second. Uh, yes, I happen to know that Daniel believes in evolution currently. Um, I also happen to know he's my very good brother who believes very strongly in God. Um, so at any rate, but that's coming up here in just a second because you make an absolutely important valid point there. Okay, so we'll come to that in one second. But I'm going to tell you that everybody needs to give thought to evolutionary theory. Uh, you need to understand it. If you don't understand it, you can't say it couldn't be. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You can't criticize something you don't know about. Uh, that doesn't make any sense. So you need to understand it. You, know, you may not want to live and breathe it for hundreds of hours, uh, uh, you know, ongoing, like, like I, because I happen to have some passion for that. You don't have to do that, but you need to at least understand it, okay, uh, of what's going on. A lot of, uh, of evolutionists, whether they believe in a creator or not, have rightly criticized a lot of people who don't believe in evolution by saying, you don't even understand it. And sometimes they're exactly right. Okay, so uh, you know, I, 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 I hope to be fair, honest, and have some kind of a valid intellectual approach. Um, you need to, to be able to understand whether it meets the logical criteria for being believable or not. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's going to be our quest here. Uh, you need to understand whatever it is you believe, whether you believe that evolution took place or you believe it didn't, either way. You need to understand why there are so many people who believe something opposite from what you believe. Okay, because wherever you are, let me assure you, there are plenty of people who disagree with you. You need to understand what that is. And be able, whatever your conclusion, be able to, to know with an intelligent, cogent series of reasoning why you believe what you do. Let me stress this, without anybody attacking the character, the motives, the honesty, uh, you know, or the intelligence of people who disagree with them. I don't care what side you're on. I just say again, there's no place for that. Okay, let's stick to logic and, and, and honest argument and not resort to, you know, finally what I call 
you're ugly and your mother dresses you funny because you disagree with me and I can't, I can't explain why, so I just criticize you. Okay, I have no use for that coming from either any side of this, okay? All right. Uh, and uh, by the way, let me just give you a, a little bit of, a, of quick history here. Um, some history on, on evolutionary thought. Uh, I'm sure you are familiar with the name Charles Darwin. Some of his early observations were, were published in, uh, um, in, in uh, his travels on a, a British ship called the Beagle, a scientific exploration uh, ship, 1839. He kind of began to formulate some of ideas and jointly published them with Alfred Russell Wallace in 1858. Uh, and there was an ongoing dispute between the two of who actually came up with this theory, etc. Darwin generally gets credit for that. Wallace probably had a whole lot to do with it. Uh, but at any rate, he, he kind of made it a little more specific in his book. Uh, the full title was On the Origin of Species, 1859. And then he added to that some with The Descent of Man in 1871. Um, some people will attack Darwin. You know, was he personally honest, etc.? I, I don't know. I will say this. He contributed some important thought, all right? and he was at least an original thinker, so I'm gonna give him a lot of credit for that. Uh, he may very well have uh, had some other motives and some shortcomings, uh, but that's really not my purpose here. Okay, later on, people have augmented the, this, and as I said, especially as we discover more about DNA, genetics, etc., then this theory kind of gets augmented, at least in, in general, uh, as, as we know things that Darwin could not possibly have known. All right, here's how we're going to take a look at, at evolution. And I uh, have been struggling with this again, how to cram this in and what to leave out or what to cover in extremely cursory fashion uh, because out of mercy for you and our time constraints, uh, we're going to have to do that. If you want to know more, there, there will be more that I'll be happy to give you in these slides and would be happy to talk one-on-one -on -one with anybody about this if you're interested in it. But I'm going to break it down in, into to, uh, four things here. First, the very unique way that evolutionary theory gets, gets treated and handled, which is generally very different from any other realm of science. There's only one other thing that I've ever been able to see in the scientific realm, you might say, that gets treated like evolutionary theory. Only one other. Um, all right, so we're going to look at that. We're going to look at some of the foundational assumptions of, of evolution. Because as I studied more and more, I finally started realizing, wait a minute, yeah, it gets treated very differently, and there are some important assumptions that, uh, that become almost kind of uh, universal uh, with evolutionary thoughts, and those need to be dissected. I don't think you'll hear that really anywhere else. Um, all right, then critical analysis of the evidence, because that's what it really ought to come down to. What can we, if we can't directly test it, at least what can we observe? All right, that's, that's where it really ought to come down to. And that's going to include that uh, idea set of punctuated equilibrium. And then we'll try to put it, uh, some analysis together and give some consideration to the idea of theistic evolution. Now, this is the idea that Daniel mentioned just a moment ago. It's a very important idea uh, because the, the idea, it just generally simplified, is this. There are a whole lot of people who believe that this universe did not come into existence without the action of a superior entity, that it just doesn't really make the best sense any other way. And many of these people believe that the precise organization of this universe, so unlikely by chance, was not by chance. It was probably at the direction of a superior entity who wanted it this way. And that the initial appearance of life on this planet, extremely unlikely to have been able to occur without intervention, that it did have intervention, that there was a superior entity who created life on this planet some early, I'll say primitive life, etc., and then allowed the evolutionary process to take place and bring it to what we have now. So you see, it's theistic evolution. Evolution, but with a creator as the originator of it. You would be surprised, probably, how many people who you might think are atheists, they're actually not. They are evolution believers who suspect that there was a cause and a creator behind it. Okay, and, and I give a great deal of respect to that. 
uh, and we'll look at that. So let's start with kind of the unique premises and, and the treatment of the theory. Again, I, I don't think these, these first two parts, I don't think you're going to hear anywhere else, but they're important for you to know uh, because I, I never found them anywhere like, hey, here's, here's this, this, this. Uh, I'm piecing together and finally realized here's what's going on with this thought. Okay. I'm going to show you seven things, seven ways, and I'll, I'll, I'll list six of them up front and save one for later. But seven ways that the evolutionary theory is not treated like virtually any other scientific or, or you know, possibly scientific idea that I've ever seen except for one of them, uh, which has come about fairly recently. Okay, the hypothesis was formulated, proposed, and promoted, this is by Darwin, etc., without any evidence that actually suggested it. Normally, when you start an experiment or an inquiry, it's because you've seen something that's like, hey, wow, I can't explain that. Uh, but, I, but what I see in it suggests that this could be the cause, so therefore I'm going to investigate this. Okay, um, so that's a little unusual. Uh, it was, of course, in opposition to a very apparent alternative that it might have been designed and created, etc. Uh, but this first one, we are, uh, and I'm not getting into the full details of this yet, that's to come, but in evolution, we, we should assume that extraordinarily ordered information like your genetic makeup, your genome, uh, implies that it came from random events, not intelligent design. All right, now look. I'm very willing to consider any idea, no matter why somebody thought of it. So I'm going to give a pass on this, okay? I, I think a lot of things are worth considering, no matter how the idea occurred to you. Maybe it was just, a, you know, whatever, the, the bar of soap hit you on the head when you were in the shower and it made you think of some side. I, that's fine with me. You, you come up with any idea, I'll say, hey, why not? Let's consider it, okay? So it doesn't bother me how, how Darwin came up with it, but it is a deviation from the, the usual process. I will note this. Just take a look at this uh, fairly random collection of, of objects over there. Here's a paperback book, uh, one that you probably fairly famous. Um, here's a scientific calculator, which I just love. I have certain neuroses, as we all do. Most of mine are fairly inexpensive. Hot Wheels cars, scientific calculators, a few other little items like that, mechanical pencils. I don't know why. Love them. Anyway, you have your things. We all do. All humans are weird. We only differ in the details and the magnitude. Okay. But whatever. I also happen to love that. Um, don't eat the whole thing at once, and if you do, make sure you brush your teeth. But at any rate, uh, and here's a, a little rubber, you know, ball that's painted to look like a like a soccer ball. Okay. Uh, all right. I, I just grabbed four things and and, and took a picture. But of those four things of varying complexity, how many of those do you reasonably think came into being without any uh, intelligent design intervention? Zero. I, 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 there's nobody in here who thinks that any of these things happened to come about without somebody's careful design. Now, you may not know who, and you don't have to. You may not know exactly how they did it, and you actually don't have to at the moment. But you know, there was a factory, a whatever, that produced this. There was somebody on a typewriter. Okay, and again, you don't have to know who. A lot of people think that book was actually written by Truman Capote. I don't know. Um, I don't know. But I have strong reason to think that somebody wrote it very deliberately and spent a lot of time doing it. All right? That's my first inference, like I said a while ago. I'll consider alternatives. I'll consider that it might have happened randomly. We're going to give fair thought to that. But I just want to stress to you that when you see something that, that really smacks of design, there's a good chance it might have been designed. You ever heard of SETI? The Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence? Okay. Telescopes, radio telescopes all over the world just pointed out in different parts of space listening for anything. Listening for any signal that might be a, a deliberate signal instead of just cosmic background noise. Any signal. Do you know how much excitement there would be if there were ever a, a, an ordered signal heard, something that contained information? I mean, if you, if you let me just say this, if you hear da 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 you may not know Morse code, I bet you know that one, SOS, 
would you assume that that happened randomly or would you think there might be somebody who sent that? Okay. SETI is based on the, the premise that if you, if you see ordered information, it might very well indicate an intelligent source that deliberately put that information out. Does that make sense? Okay, and that's why after all these years we continue to fund this project listening for anything that might say there was intelligence somewhere. Because if you heard that signal, that would be your first inference. Might have come from intelligence. If you receive a signal, uh, okay, et cetera, uh, there's been all kinds of movies about, you know, what, what, what might that signal be, et cetera. But you get the idea, okay? Um, so you have to consider that, uh, that things might have been designed if they, if they look designed, and that's what the early evidence would have suggested instead of random events. All right, here's the second way that the evolutionary hypothesis or theory is treated very differently. It was originally put forth by Darwin without any actual proposed mechanism. He didn't say how these gradual changes occurred, he just said they did. All right, and now, uh, that we know about DNA, we know about genes, okay? Genetic mutations are, are now proposed as the cause of it, but there's still no proposed sequence. It was this mutation, this one, this one, this one, this one. It was just, well, whatever ones needed to happen, happened for us to be here. That's pretty vague, okay? In fact, that's extremely vague, but still, I'll, t I'll take it, I'll take it, although I recognize the shortcomings in it. Uh, and there's no precise mechanism proposed for that even after 160 years after Darwin first put this idea uh, forth. All right, a little different. All right, number three, it was initially completely unfalsifiable. His theory, originally there was absolutely no way that you could potentially disprove it. Now, many people will tell you if you cannot potentially falsify something, you shouldn't even consider it. I will tell you, you ought to have great skepticism about something that, that can't be falsified. You don't not consider it, you need to consider everything. But initially it was completely unfalsifiable, so if you want to be strict about that, it should never have even been considered. Make sense? Okay, but I say let's consider it anyway. Um, all right, it now is still largely unfalsifiable, but there are ways that it can be potentially falsified, and we're gonna get into those. All right, here's the fourth one. In this case, the disqualification of the, of the major competing hypothesis, that is intentional design by a superior entity, is eagerly sought and largely enforced. I've shown you a few glimpses into that, okay? Uh, but as you read more and more uh, of this, you will find outright ridicule for anybody who would even consider that there might be a designer and a creator. All right. I'm not going to ridicule the, the idea that it could have happened without a creator. Let's be open-minded. Because if you, if you have to say, no, we refuse to consider this. You remember the statement from Yuri that I showed you a few minutes ago? We all believe as an article of faith that it happened randomly. Well, I'd rather look at the competing evidence pro and con and see which makes the most sense. Uh, okay. You need to be aware of this, uh, and I'm not making it up, I, I, I'm, and I'm not trying to pat myself on the back at all that, that I have spent many, many hundreds of hours researching this, okay? There is among many, among many, not all, but among many, especially the atheistic believers, that you must not even be allowed to consider that there could have been a superior entity behind it. That's important. Okay, and you remember early on I showed you, you know, kind of a valid thought process. You have to consider all hypotheses and you have to be willing to discard one if it doesn't make any sense. Okay, the evolutionary hypothesis is generally avidly shielded from any truly critical analysis and falsification effort. I'll show you more about that too. And finally, instead of resting on solid observable evidence like you would demand for most theories, this one is actually still based on a series of assumptions of things that could have happened. We'll look at those in a minute. And those I'm gonna really compress, for, again, out of respect for your time and the constraints we have. Uh, you may wanna think more about them, but I'm gonna fly through those, actually. 
Uh, but it's based on a series of assumptions, not on actual observed evidence. Now, we're going to look at that evidence, because I'm not telling you there's not any. We're going to look at it carefully. Yeah. I, I know we're, we're pressure time, so I can't go into any details at all. I just want to go on record and say I disagree with every one of your points. I'm okay. Sorry. And I can document every one of them. So, but I appreciate, I appreciate your, your good, honest statement. Um, believe me, I have not gone into all citation uh, stuff here, um, but that's fine. Even if you discard everything I just said, and even if it was all wrong, that's fine. It's, it won't even make any difference. Uh, these are just a series of observations as I've gone through this. So uh, again, I can document every one of these, but I appreciate your, your honest statement, and, and it won't matter. It, it won't matter. Even if you totally ignore every, uh, the last six things I just said there, we're still going to proceed to look at the evidence, etc. Um, but there are some assumptions on which it's built, and I'm, I'm going to fly through these very quickly. But here they are. And again, I didn't find these anywhere. I had to assemble these for, for, from all of the reading. The first is that anything that can be conjectured, is po that is, anything is possible, no matter how unlikely that anything is possible. That is a foundational assumption of evolution, that the, the very unlikely could have happened. Because we're talking about things that anybody would agree are extremely, even the most avid uh, evolutionist uh, certainly will agree, yeah, this, this, is not, this is not likely, this is not probable, we're just saying that, that this is how it happened despite the improbability. Okay, so the idea of, at first is anything that anything is possible, no matter how unlikely. Therefore, given enough time, anything will eventually happen. Okay, that is a basic assumption behind uh, evolutionary theory. The third one, and given enough time, and maybe enough universes, as we've told you, is, is uh, being often uh, relied upon now, enough millions of universes to kind of hopefully overcome some of that improbability, that hopefully it would happen in one of them, that is the one you're living in, because you're here to ask the question. Well, given enough time, it will happen again and again. Uh, the fourth is that what's sometimes called microevolution, uh, which we can observe, there are some things, I don't like the term microevolution much, because it's actually not evolution, but anyway, there are things, natural selection, we're going to look at that. Oh, that's real. It's absolutely real. You can observe it. Uh, no doubt about it, okay? So the idea is that uh, that confirms these assumptions, and, and therefore it implies the occurrence of, of, you know, a much larger occurrence of, of evolution, okay? And fifth, therefore, that's what happened. Okay, it could have happened, and so that's what happened, um, even though it may be highly improbable and counterintuitive. So those are some assumptions that, that uh, evolution or evolutionary thought rests on. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, very quickly just introduce you to these, and then we'll pick it up. And, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I think you would find this, in general, uh, a, a little less interesting. Um, Etc. Unless you're really into philosophy of thought, okay. But here's the first one: anything that that can be conjectured, anything that I can theorize, is actually possible, okay. Uh, and and more specifically, therefore, random genetic mutations can produce useful new features and functions. All right. Uh, and now that could be true. It could be true. I'm just telling you, you cannot assume that it is true. Here's why. why. Uh, well, uh, actually, let me uh, continue to be more specific. The second one, that these useful new features will occur and they will be preserved and passed on, okay? And there will be an unending procession of these beneficial mutations, not frequently, but over long periods of time, which will build advantage upon advantage and finally yield major changes, and that there has been enough time that life has existed on this planet for this to have happened. Okay, and that if we can see significant changes occurring in a short period of time, and I'll show you there are some of those, this proves the, the first three assumptions, and then it makes the whole theory true by extrapolation. Okay, if I can see these bird beaks changing this much in 30 years, then, then again, well, give, give that a few billion or whatever, and hey, it's a piece of cake, all right? So that's the, uh, kind of the idea. And therefore, that's how it happened. And it must be true because we're here. We kind of looked at that anthropic principle. Okay, so those are some of the assumptions. Um, you won't see these listed out much, but these are very widely held. 
Some of them are, are just, you know, assumed to be self-evident. You shouldn't even question them. Um, and you'll find some pretty vitriolic things that are written about anybody who would even think to believe that evolution might not be true. Now, I'm not ascribing that to everybody. I have some very dear friends, uh, not just including, you know, at least one in the room here and maybe one, maybe more than that. But I have a number of very dear friends and very respected colleagues, etc., who believe in evolution and are also very, very um, respectful of people who don't believe in evolution. And that should be true going the other way as well. Okay. So I'm not saying everybody, but uh, there, there's some nasty stuff out there, um, especially uh, for people who might do that. Okay. But we'd better question all of these assumptions if we really want to get somewhere. So the first one we're going to take a look at when we start next week. We're going to get into to biologic stuff here pretty quick. But the first one we're going to look at next week, and it involves the idea that anything is possible. And it's going to start with my hand and a brick and atomic structure. I know that's so exciting. I know you're not going to sleep for the next seven days till you can come back and hear that. Folks, thank you for being here. Uh, I hope that there's going to be something useful here. And if nothing else, you can grab muffins and donuts. So at least you got that. Thanks, y'all. I appreciate it.